Welcome back to Nightcap Chat, the pop culture, comics, and gaming podcast. Today we talk about independent comics, and we recap Phoenix Fan Fusion and bring you a couple of interviews from some of the guests. I'm Blade O'Neill. I'm Ken Brown. Now, Ken, Phoenix Fan Fusion was lots of fun, but before we jump into it, you know, we've been talking a lot about Marvel and DC, and it's easy to give them love, but, I mean, there's also independent comics, and there's a lot of great ones. Um... Now, personally, like I, I really enjoyed collecting uh, Witchblade and uh, and Tomb Raider. Um, I mean, that was that was a long time ago uh, already. Because I mean, it's the Mark Silvestri art. I mean, like, how do you how do you go wrong with that? No, absolutely. A lot of today's great characters at the big two at Marvel DC started off as indie creators. Oh I yeah, mean, absolutely. Are one of the biggest ones in the industry. Brian Michael Bendis started mm-hmm. off doing like Goldfish, and it's a. Uh, you know, just doing like these small pop noir crime comics. Mm-hmm. And uh, he started getting so good at it that, you know, Joe Quesada was looking at other avenues and started pulling from the indie market. And Brian Michael Bendis laid that paved that um, paved that street for creators to be pulled out of smaller press. Absolutely. And, and flip side of that coin. I mean, look at all these, you know, Marvel and DC creators that. You know, started up image, you know, yes. you had McFarlane, uh, you know, Mark Silvestri, Rob Jim Liefeld. Yes. I mean, like some phenomenal uh, comic book creators. And like, you well, know, even they, earlier than that, John Byrne doing Next Men and Mike Mignola exactly. doing yep. Hellboy. Mm-hmm. And uh, even, um, oh my gosh, dude, I'm drawing blanks. Like uh, hey. Neil, Neil Adams broke on his own to start his own comic company, Continuity Comics. Greg Capullo, you know, was doing, uh, I think it was like some X-Force stuff. And he was yes, even like on Quasar. Quasar. Yes. And then you moved on to, to Spawn. Spawn. You know, like, people don't even think about, you know, him being on those Marvel books before he did, you know, like what he's, you know, best now known for is, yeah. you know, probably things like Spawn. Or, and it's funny, too. They used to be thought of as poachers from every time Marvel got some big new artists that they would steal them. Really? But, like that, for instance, like Rob Liefeld took Stephen Platt off of Moon Knight and put him on a profit almost immediately okay. after he got started. Yeah. And then once again, like I, you know, Todd getting Greg Pulu off of Marvel's mm-hmm. X-Force and Quasar. But now they're like a Tony, dream team. Yeah. You know? and, and Tony Daniel too, even coming off of X-Force after Capulu left X-Force. Mm-hmm. Tony Daniel eventually replaced Capulu on Spawn for a while. And now he's about to come back, I think in 300, right? Isn't that, isn't that correct? Yeah. Spawn 300 is going to have a bunch of all-star artists working with Todd on that mm-hmm. book, which would be freaking awesome to see. And uh, but uh, it's they they don't talk about how many artists were actually discovered through image that eventually were once again, I hate the word poached, but poached by Marvel and DC Mm -hmm. after image discovered them. Like, for instance, J. Scott Campbell. Yes. Was one of the biggest artist names in comics to this day. Absolutely. David Finch Mm -hmm. is another artist. Michael Turner, another artist that was discovered. Jason Fabic. An artist that was discovered. But by here's the thing: the if Marvel if Marvel offers you a deal, I mean, how do you? you I'm not going to say no. You're not going to say no. I mean, like, how well, do you how do you say no to that? I mean, like, no. sure, you know, it's like the evil empire. But I mean, it's it's yeah. So too, it's like you gotta you gotta get that notoriety of doing what you love growing up. Mm-hmm. Is what I heard. Like the best from a lot of these creators is yes, I could keep on making my own money doing my own thing. But these are characters they grew up with at Marvel and DC. And they have ideas of things they've never seen happen with their characters that they love. And, you know, that's the big argument between Bendis and Kirkman Mm -hmm. is like Bendis loves working for the big companies because it's his favorite sandbox. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 characters that already have development, but potential for more to reach. Absolutely. And when you're creating new characters that have never been seen before, there's that risk that they're not going to stick. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Not everybody's a Todd McFarlane or a Jim Lee or a Rob Liefeld or a Greg Capullo mm-hmm. where they already have that following yep. of people that are just going to give it a shot. Like mm-hmm. Mark Miller, same thing too, dude. He cut his teeth doing some small independent books, but then he's the father of, I think, the true Avengers movies because those Avengers movies were more based off of the Ultimates than a lot of Marvel Comics yeah. history. Absolutely. Of original Avengers yeah. story talk. Because people always tell me like that. What should I read when I come in to uh, check out the Avengers stuff? And I go, dude, read the Ultimates. Because mm-hmm. that's the first concept you ever saw of Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury. Yep. And, and that's and where the Chitauri invasion concept came from. Uh, came from. That yep. was never a Marvel 616 no, concept. It wasn't. I mean, there was Scrolls in the 616 yep. universe. And they eventually worked Scrolls into the movies, obviously, mm-hmm. by the time it was all said and done. But um, Mark Miller 
is pretty much one of the best indie writers. Now talk about a guy that's a, a person that if, if Mark Miller writes something, I'm giving it a shot. Yeah. And, and stuff that he writes, I mean, it's so good that Netflix decided to make a contract and buy out his company. Mm-hmm. So Miller World is now exclusively a Netflix property. And not just the TV shows, mm-hmm. but all the comics now that are produced mm-hmm. are now Netflix comics. Interesting. And so that's what I'm wow. saying too. The indie creator world has a major footing in the comic industry more than any time in history. Absolutely. Well, how could, how could you not, how could you not like, even foresee this coming? Is it, all of these media outlets see the success of, you know, Marvel movies and DC movies and like, what else is there to get that big show or that big movie? Like yes. you got to go to the indie comics. We saw what Netflix did last week too, right? They got to deal with dark horse. So for option, I yes. completely missed that. Yeah, Dark Horse. Now, yeah. since they lost Marvel, uh-huh. they made a deal with Dark Horse to have first option on any of the properties before they really? shop it anywhere else. And so you're probably going to see maybe a BPRD show. A lot of people are thinking that you may see. I mean, it already works so well with Umbrella Academy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why they did that option. Like whatever you guys can throw at us that you think will be good go for it well and, and with them losing the marvel stuff you know all those marvel shows got canceled you know netflix was hungry for for something to replace that because they're they're suspected to lose a lot of subscribers when disney plus comes out yes and then i said too there's like black hammer is another dark horse thing jeff lemire who's okay the, i'm not familiar the, with that one the black hammer is a little bit of an x-men type of feel to it okay but um i don't i haven't read it a whole lot but i know jeff lemire is uh He's worked on Thanos. He okay. obviously Sweet Tooth was his big claim to fame mm-hmm. when he was working with Vertigo. Uh, he has a, a very, very big, big, big following as an indie writer that's worked for both companies mm-hmm. as well. He worked on Justice League Dark. Okay. Uh, he worked on Animal Man, New 52. Mm-hmm. He's just a very, very good uh, him and Scott Snyder. I think during the New 52 were the most significant writers that DC was interesting at that time. And um, but uh, Black Hammer, I can almost guarantee will be one of those comics that you'll see on netflix within the next five years well, and there's been successful uh you know i don't know if i watchman i believe i would call that an indie comic you know even though you know dc owns vertigo you saw showtime or was it hbo doing a watchman tv series i think it's, I think it's hbo, HBO okay. um which which the trailer looked interesting i mean you know you got to reserve judgment right until until you see it i mean they're kind of doing their own thing like why why redo Watchmen like that movie was was almost perfect. Oh man, absolutely. I mean, all the way up to the ending, they made it make more sense than the graphic novel did. Instead yes, of the aliens they, coming down, Dr. Manhattan was a perfect, you know, the bombs we're, around a uh, spoiler mm-hmm. alert. If anyone hasn't seen Watchmen 15 years later, <laughs> oh, however many years <laughs> yeah, ago, that, what was it like that, yeah. that octopus looking monster, yes, uh, like Cthulhu thing. looking thing coming down yeah. that Osmond Deus mm-hmm. brought down to earth. Yeah. I mean, I get why they changed it, but I mean, there was, there were so many things, uh, if you haven't read the Watchmen comics, I mean, I, I'm really glad I went on my way to read them before yes. I saw the movie because there was there were so many scenes right out of right out of the the book. And my favorite, I mean, it's just it's just a little moment, but I thought it was just so funny, is when uh, when Alabama was talking to Silk Spectre, right? Yes. Um, they were talking about well, what happened to Rorschach? Oh, like or oh, no, 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 not Rorschach. Uh, there happened to some guy who was like flashing people, like oh, whatever happened to him? He's like oh, well, he tried to pull that on Rorschach, and like. Oh yeah, and then what? Like that Rorschach threw him down an elevator shaft. <laughs> like like there was just a little little exchange, but I, like when I read it, I thought it was hysterical. Yes. And it, the, those little little details like that, you know, just really made Watchmen uh, a great movie. Yes. Well, that's like pure Alan Moore. I mean, I said too, yeah. Alan Moore is once again one of those guys that is one of the best writers, both working independently or mm-hmm. for DC. Interesting. I mean, the Swamp Thing run he had is one of the most literarily respected comics on a character yeah. that is very unrespected among fans, except when Alan Moore's writing him. You know, mm-hmm. I guess Scott Snyder did a pretty decent run on Swamp Thing during New 52, and that's okay. almost as close as Alan Moore, but nowhere near as touchable as what Alan Moore did yeah. on Swamp Thing. Yeah. But two big ones that were indies for Alan Moore were Walk Through Hell, Mm-hmm. And I think it was movie adapted as well. And that was a Jack the Ripper story. Hmm. And then the second one that a lot of people didn't like in the theaters, but is a great comic series of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You know, I actually liked that movie. I didn't mind it, but a lot of people I didn't, told me it was horrible. I didn't read the comics, admittedly, and I didn't realize it was even a comic book movie. Mm-hmm. But like, it was okay. I mean, I think it was... It was just a fun story. It was a great like, popcorn film. Yeah, taking uh, taking you know characters like the the, the Bride of Dracula, the, the Invisible Man, uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, um, 
and then I don't know if this stems from the comic or not, but like the, the main character, you know, he talks about like his, his childhood friend, you know, such and such. Like he was, he was, I think he was supposed to be, you know, was it Huckle, Huckleberry? Oh, Huckleberry and, I think as a two, I'm trying to remember myself. And well, as was a two was like that. Yeah, and then of course, you know, had Sean Connery as, as Alan Quartermain. Yes. And like now, you know, everyone says, you know, that's why Sean Connery doesn't do uh, movies anymore. Is but it then, because of that? That's that's what I've read online is that you know because what movies has he done after League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? None. Wow. Well, you also have movies like like V for Vendetta. I feel like that mm, that's another Alan Moore. That's yeah, but that's, that's DC still, and but... that's strayed. Yeah, I think from the from the comics, but like it was still really good. And like for a long time, it was one of my one of my favorite uh, superhero movies. But the the first Ron Perlman Hellboy movie was fantastic. Yes, I thought it was awesome, and I really disappointed that we didn't get a third one, especially after the setup um, that the second one did at the end with uh, having Liz, uh, you know, be pregnant. And, you know, now he's, you know, this, this new being might, might bring about the, the end of the world. I heard a lot of people weren't happy with the new Hellboy. I haven't had a chance to that, see it. That is bombed. And I wanted to see it until I read, you know, it was, I, it was reading, it was a troubled production. You know, the producer, one of the, one or two of the producers weren't getting along with the director Wow. And like there was, there was a lot of trouble and it's, it's a shame, yes. you know, because, you know, David Harbour looked like he was going to do a good job. And he looked really good uh, as Hellboy. Um, Another great indie book that I think would be a fun movie is Eric Powell's The Goon. Okay. Have you read that before? At least I have, at, at I least have not TV read it, but I, I know what you're, I know what you're referring to. Yeah, it's like, it's like Scooby-Doo meets like a 1930s or 40s Brooklyn Okay. buddies that yeah, more yeah, or less yeah, yeah. like run through Brooklyn or they start off like kind of like coming out of Brooklyn and then they go from more or less the supernatural elements attack the town and they more or mm-hmm. less defend the town. And Interesting. Almost has to do a little bit of a Ghostbusters Scooby-Doo type of feel to it in a way. You know, but it's so much fun because it's two Brooklyn guys that are just tough as nails. Mm-hmm. You know, like it almost reminds me of in the Warner Brothers cartoons where <clears throat> there's the loud mouth, smaller guy, the dog, and mm-hmm. then the bulldog that backs him up type of thing. Yep, and the yep. goons like the backup. And then the, you know, the, the mouth of the, the South type of thing is uh-huh. the guy that uh, more or less, uh, do you know what I mean? Leads with his mouth and the goons, the muscle. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. You know, I, I can't believe it's taken this long to get a Witchblade movie. I know that's we, true. We only had we that had a TV, TV show and like, I remember watching it and I was excited cause I, you know, I, I collected the, the, the Witchblade comics, you know, in the late nine, late nineties, you know, early, early turn of the century. And like, it just, it just fell short. I didn't know what yes. they'd do with the knight armor gauntlet. I mean, like, for the for the budgets of TV shows at the time, I mean, what, what were you going to do? Yeah, so well, The Tick is another one that was an indie comic that became a TV show that's done pretty well from what I understand on Amazon. The Tick was a comic first? Yes. I did not realize yeah, that. Out of New England comics back in the East Coast. Oh my goodness, I didn't even realize yeah. that. I, I, I only watched the, the original cartoon. I thought it was its own thing. I didn't even realize yeah, that. Yeah, that was a comic series at first, and it got optioned because I guess people that liked the way it was written. I think it came out in 19... 19- I want to say like 1988, 89. Really? The Tick first comic came out. It wasn't that TV series in the 90s, the yes. Fox one? Yes, it was. I, was yeah. I loved I loved watching that. Yeah, then and the then Amazon they, one's done extremely well from what I understand. It just got canceled. Did it? Yeah, Already? they just announced <sighs> it days ago. Jeez, that's horrible, dude, because a lot of people tell me they like it, especially Tick fans. I watched the first episode. It was okay. Okay. Nothing super spectacular? It was okay. I was I was interested to see where, where it went, though. Um, I don't think we had Amazon Prime at the time, so I never, I never caught up. Wow, Ben Edlin. I did not realize that. Yeah, it was a start off as a newsletter mascot to New England Comics chain of Boston area comic stores. Interesting. And then they started developing into comic stories mm-hmm. from there. I loved the old uh, old nineties cartoon. It was it was a lot of fun. Yes, that's it too. It's 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 a it's a fun character that is an easy translation to mass media. Well, you know, I'm surprised that uh, they they tried to do a live action tick show. Um, a little after the cartoon where um, Patrick Warburton played the tick. Really? And like that was, you don't remember that? No, I didn't see really? that. Unfortunately, I was not. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was the tick, you know, nice. was, you, you know, Patrick Warburton, right? Okay. So he's the pretty boy muscle, muscle guy, right? This guy, right? I'm sorry. Patrick Warburton. Yes, dude. Yeah. 
That's right. Okay, so he played the ticket. He played the ticket, a live action. A live, a live action oh yeah, show. that's right. Okay, it's about the cartoon for a second. No, so, no, 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 no. It was a live action show. I, I yes, got canceled yes, okay. really fast. Yes, dude. Remember the the, the TV series? Yes, mm-hmm. dude. He was the tick in the TV yeah, series. Yeah. My apologies, dude. Let's get remember the 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 name that went with the face. There. <laughs> yeah. As I said too, it's like that. Uh, there's so many actors that I am forgetting the different roles until I see them yeah, again. Yeah. Because there's so much stuff that's out there, but it's freaking awesome to. But put the I, two and two together in my head now. <laughs> I, 4.6. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, but the tick, the tick is kind of, it's kind of easier because um, it's, you know, it's satire. Yes. You know, it's so like, yeah, I mean, satire is easy to accept, especially when there's, you know, crazy things happening. You know, it's not hard to you know, make the audience okay with, with, with it's what, not as serious. Going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't have to explain themselves mm-hmm. as much because it's all just off the wall. But I would, I, would, I want a Witchblade movie so bad. I'm really glad that because there were rumors for a while that they're into that Megan Fox one, you know, years and years ago. Oh, yes. So glad that that never happened because she, uh, she is not Witchblade. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking she'd make a good fathom when they were talking about that. Michael Turner's fathom. I don't think she's, she's much just, of an actress. That's the thing. I think that she just can't act. I yeah. mean, she's got the look of being some of these sure. characters, but it's just the Transformers movies killed her. Mm-hmm. And I'm just kind of going, you know, what can you do? Mm-hmm. And if you can hold a whole, carry a whole movie, I mean, you can't, you can't carry as a co-star, mm-hmm. but to be the lead actress, it's, it's hard for her to do, unfortunately. Cause I said too, she is a very, very pretty woman, but you got to be able to entertain the audience mm-hmm. as well. Well, and whatever happened to that red Sonia movie? Cause I thought they even started yeah, filming what happened with that. And who was supposed to be red Sonia in that again too? It was a Rose, great actress. Rose, Rose McGowan. Okay. Rose McGowan. I, I think she even got hurt either like when they started filming or, or when they were practicing like rehearsals or something. And wow. I don't know for the longest time they were insisting it was still happening. Like I wasn't sure if like the director or something who was making it like had some of those, you know, allegations against him. I think, I oh, think wow. that's, that's what, not, yeah. I think that's what happened. That I had to double quick. check. Yeah. Um, but I mean, from the posters that released, I mean, it looked they like looked it amazing. was, looks like it was shaping up to, to, I mean, maybe we'll still see a Red Sonja movie uh, soon. Yeah. So that would be, that would be pretty epic to see a Red Sonja movie for sure. Um, I'm trying to think of like other great indie comic stories that would be awesome, awesome movies. Um, Witchblade. Yes. Witchblade. <laughs> I'm going to keep right? saying Witchblade. Witchblade. Like we don't, we don't get enough Witchblade anything. Like what I, do you think about Jamie Foxx being spawned next year then in that case of going to image stuff that's becoming film again? Here's the thing. Like, who are any of us to have a problem with who Todd McFarlane picked to play Spawn? No, I think it's he created awesome. Spawn. Yes. If this is how he imagined Spawn, like who am I to say, no, that's not Spawn. I no, think it, Todd McFarlane picked Jamie Foxx. Yes. So Jamie Foxx is, is Spawn. Spawn. I think that's brilliant. Too. <laughs> I said too, Jamie Foxx is a name recognition yeah. that if they get the Spawn franchise going, he's going to keep that name recognition to the like michael j white was an awesome spawn i I thought he did great yes he was fantastic he didn't have quite the name recognition i think to keep on going no where jamie fox it's like dude jamie fox i'm gonna go see jamie fox film just because it's jamie fox and todd todd is really taking this like indie film approach to it yes so i mean that's what you probably want to do is have that draw and like don't don't look at this as jamie fox as this nerdy electro like jamie fox is a really good actor yes i would love to see him do more or less the pre al simmons it's, they know mm-hmm. stuff where before he became spawn i would be but surprised we if we Jamie don't get fox that. like at least the first 30 minutes of the film really develop his relationship with chapel do you know what i mean and things like that were there it's like the that's gonna Priest. be a flashback thing i hope so because that would be kind of fun to see special ops al simmons sure lead into where you 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 become invested in al simmons mm-hmm. and not just spawn but spawn and al simmons during this whole absolutely story. And, and we got Jeremy Renner, you know, on board, you know, with nice. the Spawn movie too. Who's Jeremy Renner going to play? He is playing Sam and Twitch. Twitch. I'm going to do it's like that. I was thinking as I'm looking up like Spawn to the text that popped in my head all of a sudden. Twitch. Without even seeing it. Sam and Twitch. Yeah, Twitch. Yeah, see, so Renner's playing Twitch. So I mean, like another great actor. I mean, the, the casting shaping up uh, seems like you know they he knows what he wants. Uh, we're probably going to get like this horror, you know, movie element, which yes, which is uh, a great way to do it. Uh, 
and hopefully it beats New Mutants to the punch uh, doing that because that New Mutants trailer looked very horror and it would be a shame if we'll anyone to accuse the Todd McFarlane movie of like, oh, you're just doing New Mutants because yeah. that's that's a really stupid thing to say. Yeah, I said too, it was like that uh, New Mutants reminds me a little bit of Nightmare on Elm Street type of feel to it mm-hmm. where it's like that, okay, like the the demon bears, like your Freddy Krueger mm-hmm. haunting you in your dreams. Type Interesting, of thing. yeah. And it's, um, but, uh, I think the spawn I said too, is being like a new level super hero horror character mm-hmm. of like being something that's what, you know, Batman s- strives to be in Gotham city mm-hmm. of being the scarier than, you know, poop mm-hmm. yeah. vigilante yep. inside of your city, protecting your city spawn takes it to a whole new level because he's supernatural. Yep. And he has other more or less demons from the underworld mm-hmm. trying to keep him in line. Yeah. So uh, he can't be pure, you know, intentioned in any way as much as he wants to be pure intention. I wonder if they'll, you know, now that, you know, Angela is at Marvel, are we going to get some kind of character to replace? You'll get Tiffany to come back. Okay. Another one of the angels that was from that same group. Give her that, you know, role. Yeah. And it. Redeemer, I think is going to play a huge role. Interesting. Because Redeemer, they're burning a few in Spawn 298, 299. Um, Redeemer is on the covers, lead up to 300. Okay. So I don't know what kind of role Redeemer is going to be playing here going forward. But if uh, it's funny because Todd's homaging a lot of the Spider Man 298, 299, 300 mm-hmm. stuff that's I going saw on. That. And in fact, Spawn 300 is another cover swipe from Spider Man 300. He's just like 298, 299 were. And it looks like he's doing that comic. Uh, he's doing that Power Rangers, I think it's number 39. Tom McFarlane is doing the cover, and it's that same. It's a, the White Ranger holding a sword with a reflection of Lord Dracon, I think it's in there. But it's his, it's an, it's an homage to when he was doing Incredible Hulk oh, to the Hulk, Hulk 340, 340 cover. Wow. With, where, you know, it's, it's the same cover. And Todd's doing that? He's doing yeah. art on that? That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know he's spreading out from Image, doing some other stuff now. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's just the cover. Um, That's cool, though. But I, I want it. That's epic. I have to keep an eye out for that. So if any of you guys want to see what I'm talking about, if you go on Nightcap Chat's uh, Facebook page, I I posted a picture of this uh, just because I was excited. That's epic. I knew exactly what it was. I'm a huge McFarland fan. I totally missed Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's really cool. But I've got a theory that like in uh, Spider-Man 300, there was an introduction of a brand new villain that became the arch nemesis of Spider-Man, which was Venom. Uh huh. And so I'm wondering if Spawn 300, we're going to get a brand new villain that's been kind of in the shadows becoming the new arch nemesis for spawn. Interesting. Who could be, you know, more or less a reinvention of the clown type of stuff or okay. things where, cause the symbiote was the nemesis that evolved greatly into what became venom. The, the biggest legend of Spider-Man's, you know, villains gallery. And he's mm-hmm. sometimes an anti-hero too, as well. I wonder if though it'll be like an opposite, you know, spawn kind of looking a, kind at of this, a uh, this image right here. Oh, it's like, it's actually an homage to Todd, isn't it? No, it's, it's got his name on it, but it's uh, it's after McFarlane. Cause a lot of people like when they more or less do an homage towards another comic piece, they'll, they'll always give credit to the artist that they're homaging on there. I see. You know, that's, but still, I mean, that's, it's so that's, pixelated. That, that's, I can't, I can't see it. All I see is a signature. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's a cover. That's definitely off the Todd McFarlane's, you know, Hulk 340. Oh, yeah, for 100%, sure. 100%. That is epic, exactly though. what that is. It's doing, but a pretty, pretty epic. I think I need to get that cover now too. Just because I, I, I love was, cover swipes. I was actually going to call you and have, have you save me a copy until I realized like there's some logos on the bottom and I'm not sure where this is exclusive to. Says, yeah, maybe an exclusive someone made on it. This is like Joel Zar collectibles, legends, okay. comics, and games. So like, I don't know if it's I, an exclusive they made. Some company, I guess that is. I, I don't know. We'll have to, to do more research. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are more or less paying artists to do their own covers that they exclusively sell through their stores. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a pretty epic one. So Phoenix Fan Fusion 2019 was over the weekend, and we both had an incredible time there. Um, so we're going to cut to a little bit of content uh, that we brought to you. The first up we have an interview with Andy Field, uh, best known for playing Hand Unit in the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. Uh, He's also appeared in video games such as Paladins and Marvel's Avengers Academy. And we also talk a little bit about who he played in Avengers Endgame. So we're going to cut to that interview right now. 
And so you're promoting the, the new uh, VR version of Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Coming out Tuesday, Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted. is uh, it's, uh, it's on PlayStation VR, and uh, I've seen the YouTubers doing it on Oculus Rift, so I think it's still coming through Steam as well. But it looks absolutely terrifying. i got to go buy a VR setup like tomorrow so I can play it Tuesday. And it's overwhelming. Like, the creatures are like seven feet tall. I mean, it's just uh, it's terrifying. And instead of just having an animal pop up at your window, they're like walking past, and it's a little creepier. And you know, so yeah, it's it's gonna look good. So you're also promoting some uh, voiceover classes. Yeah, yeah. So I used to be a teacher, and so I miss teaching anyway. And um, not. And I kind of had to figure out how to become a voice actor. And it's really, you can do it from anywhere if you have the hustle. Uh, I know lots and lots of voice actors are making six figures from the middle of the continent, not from L.A. or New York. And, uh, and I like sharing that with people. Uh, and not everybody can do it. There's a lot of hustle involved in that. I mean, it's hard. You're running a business. It isn't just turning on your microphone and people give you money. So I'll keep teaching it as long as everybody says it's a good class. And so there we go. Has anybody recognized you from uh, Avengers Endgame yet? No, no one has. Uh, I'm soldier number 183 in Avengers Endgame. That was just a fun background gig. Uh, you can't get rich or famous doing background work, but going to be in the biggest movie in, in the history of movies has, it was pretty awesome to be a part of that. So, And I was there because I was a, a background in Walking Dead, which I was also a fan of, although like many Walking Dead fans, I've lately not become become not a fan. It's just, I didn't even watch the whole episodes I was in on Walking Dead. But because they both filmed in Atlanta it, and I lived over that way, it wasn't hard to, to get in on that. You just had to submit and if you looked right, you got the parts. So. Uh, did any of your military experience have anything to do with that? It absolutely did because uh, I was one of the soldiers in 1970 when Tony Stark goes back in time and uh, I just submitted my military photo that like hung on the wall when I was the commander and they told me that they just they straight up pointed that photo said that guy for sure <laughs> and so yeah I grew a mustache and sideburns to look like a 1970 soldier and that helped uh, you know all day long they picked me out because I look legit even though it was also blurry you couldn't really tell you just never know when you're gonna get that hero shot as a background actor there well, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, you know, i got some classes coming up. Is there anything you want to plug before we go? Uh, the next class starts not this Tuesday, but the first Tuesday in June, and the classes last four months. But if you email me at andyfieldvoiceover at gmail.com, um, I teach it with Chuck Huber, the big anime voice actor, Android 17 from Dragon Ball Z, uh, among many, many others. And, uh, and Chuck is kind of the actor coach, and I'm kind of the business coach. Uh, I will forevermore be becoming an actor, and I'm getting better at coaching acting but I don't think that people should pay me for that. But getting the walkthrough on how to get this thing off the ground is, is definitely what we do. But, uh, yeah, Andy Field voiceover at gmail.com. And we're going to have all those links and information in the description of this episode's podcast. If you are interested, take a look at the description. Andy, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks again, Andy, for taking the time to talk to us here on Nightcap Chat. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I I took uh, Andy and Chuck Huber's uh, voiceover class uh, last year. And even as somebody who has worked in the video production industry professionally and um, as an actor, you know, I, I do have professional representation uh, for, for live action stuff. You know, even I didn't know, you know, really where to start with uh, the voice acting side of things, even though like I knew how to cast for it. You know, I didn't know how to go out and actually look for that work aside from, you know, a lot of like play to play sites, uh, which you'll learn, you know, more about in Andy's class or, you know, of course, you also do online research. Uh, but I, I highly recommend um, the class to anyone interested in getting started in VO. Uh, like Andy said, you know, it does take a lot of work um, to be a voice actor, especially if you're not living in a place like New York or L.A. You know, it is running your own business. Um so, so there's a lot to learn uh, about about marketing, about the the day to day, and of course, you know, you know, acting techniques. Uh, you know, as as a professional, even, you know, you you always want to be educating yourself. You know, if you think that you are too good to, you know, continue any kind of professional development, like you you have the wrong attitude. You know, um, so I, I, like I said, I can't recommend this class enough. You know, right before I was taking it, like I was trying really hard to, to shift to doing more voice work. Um, but you know, I've learned a lot. I got a lot of, you know, great leads, you know, I've learned more what to do, you know, on the, the day to day side of things. Um, so definitely once again, like we said before, check that description if you are interested in, 
uh, maybe getting a start in voiceover. So next up, we have something a little different for you. Um, for those of you who have been to Phoenix Fan Fusion or perhaps any convention, almost any convention uh, across the country, you probably have seen the the tower of T-shirts, you know. Uh, so we have a little interview for the Styling Online, which we're sure as a convention goer, if you've been to a, especially a larger convention, like you have seen them. So we're going to go a little bit onto the the inner workings of Styling Online. So here's the interview age clothing options yeah like i see little baby jumpers in here and i see like women's clothing i see like oversized clothing it's like they got a full gamut of anybody yeah ironically in this market ironically the because we, uh, we have like a kids wall over here yes um he's actually uh, going to be pushing out um kids clothing okay. like he's trying to because right now we have a buy two get one uh, deal which is great nice. i mean don't get me wrong i mean uh, and it's twenty dollars for a, a shirt two for 35 you get five bucks off you get two but he's uh currently trying to get out of the kids clothing game um okay. and oh, uh, trying to get out of it you're saying yeah so like a, a lot of the a lot of the merchandise he's uh, pushed trying to i mean put a big sale trying to get as much of it out as possible so uh, soon enough i'm not sure by the end of the year Maybe, maybe next year. Wow. We won't have uh, a kids' wall. Okay. Um, maybe we'll probably still have onesies. But, Can we still uh, ordered online from like a warehouse? Type it, thing yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm, like, I'm not sure if he's going to be getting more inside the warehouse um, for for us. But I've, at some point, I'm not entirely sure what that wall will be afterwards. Okay. Um, but I mean, eventually, at some point by the end of the year or next year, we'll be out of the kids' game, kids' kids shirts game. Wow. Um, but it, I mean, for now, I mean, we're one of the only people who has kid sizes. Um, so that, that, I think that's huge in this industry. Yeah. Like the, the more you get the younger generation involved with our exactly. fan base, the longer they're going to stay with us, too. Oh, of course. They're going to keep on passing on to their kids, too. It's like if you grow up with that at a younger age, yeah. you stay dedicated to this in the industry 110%. Yeah. Like, I started when I was nine years old, and now, like, I own a comic shop, and my daughter's, like, going around dressed as Harley Quinn. She's 17. And, yeah. And I mean, like that. It's like, it's a culture. And, oh, yeah. And her friends, and one of her best friends with her, dressed as a G.I. Joe guy. Yeah. And I'm going, dude, G.I. Joe's not being made right now. Yep. And we're getting like a 17, 18 year old kids dressing up as G.I. Joe and Harley Quinn. Which, yeah, it's not even, hasn't been relevant in so long. Absolutely. And, but yeah, you still have uh, people, I mean, younger, younger generation, like you said, yes. dressing up as it or buying their shirt, buying the shirts for G.I. Joe. And it's like, do you even watch it? Exactly. But, like, but they're like, so who's they're, Flint, huh? they're like, my dad, my dad, my dad watched it and I watched it with him. Yes. And it's like, yeah, that's how, I, that's how that happened. I got into comics and everything because of my older brother. Nice. And so I, when I was six, seven years old, uh, I never thought I'd, when I was 30, I'd be working at a comic book convention yes, it's around the, around the culture and yes. like literally in, invested in like, okay, this is what I love. That's, that's, that's what I'm selling. And I get to travel and do it. And it's fantastic. And not to mention with one of the biggest uh, vendors at any of these shows. How do you recommend people to get involved with working with style? And online? Um, it's, it's usually a lot of word of mouth. Like, um, like I said, we have a lot of locals that work with us, okay. but um, so I, I'll bring a friend in. I was brought on by another friend of mine. He had done this a few times um, in Orlando. That's where I'm from. Yes. And uh, so I uh, so we were there last week, actually, for Megacon, and uh, he brought me on, and which was was awesome. I was like, "Are you kidding? I get to work at comic book conventions? Uh, hell yeah! The hell yeah!" So I came on. That was that was three years ago. Um, and so when he brought me on, I started working, and then now I'm full time because I, I liked it so much. And not to mention, I get to travel and and is that all expenses paid by styling online for you, or yeah, 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 he, 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 yeah, yeah. We like we we like ride like RV or or fly out depending on the show. Yes. Um, and I mean, he puts us up in the hotels and everything, and uh, when we do the show and get up and go. I mean, I got to see I got to see more of the country in the last year than I've ever seen in my entire life. That's outstanding. Yeah, it's great stories too for exactly. for, for future. So when I when I go home, when I'm eventually inevitably at some point, I'll, I'll be done. I'll, I'll settle back down, down in Orlando. Okay. And I'll have I'll have a, a bucket of stories that I, I can tell my are friends you, and everything. Are you a big wrestling fan? Uh, I was. I haven't really been into it in a few years. So I know it's like Orlando is very big for the yeah. wrestling circuit. No, yeah, no, actually, um, uh, in Claremont, where, like, where I'm from, about 20 minutes out of Orlando. Okay. Um, uh, Samoa Joe and nice. like his his like his family, they they kind of uh, live around there, and they have like a wrestling uh, WXW like wrestling little camp thing, and they have they have their own thing there. It was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the, the, the wrestling is uh, I think because I know there's like a training 
facility uh, somewhere Wholesale in that. Arena. Yeah, exactly. Which is pretty cool. Dude. And another thing, too, about Orlando. Disneyland's got a huge presence on the West Coast. Mm. And it's more, more or less being influenced by Marvel since Disney and Star Wars have okay. merged all together. I know they did is, uh, made a Guardians yes, uh, right. ride. As, is the Orlando Disney World experiencing the same type of comic book influence that Disneyland has been since the merger? Uh, I want to say yes and no. Only because with Universal um, okay. having uh, the Marvel license. Yeah, they still have the Marvel license. And from what I heard, I don't know if it's entirely accurate, but when I, I actually worked there for a time uh, at the Marvel Superhero Island in the comic book store, which was like a dream in and of itself. Like I got oh, working at a comic book, comic book store in a theme park. Yes, that's like, awesome. How does that happen? Is the restaurant still there? Because there used to be one of Universal <laughs> Studios Hollywood, and they closed down the restaurant in the Universal Studios Hollywood. Is there still the Marvel themed restaurant in Orlando? I don't mm, believe so. Okay. Um, I honestly am not sure, but I know that um, they still. The guy, the gentleman, told me when I was working there that they have a perpetual license. Okay. So basically. They can't make any new rides. Okay. They can update the, what they have. So, like the Spider-Man ride, they uh, it used to be uh, like a, like a, a '90s animated series looking um, cartoon uh, as you go through. Yes. But now it's updated and it's HD. Nice. But they just can't make any new rides. That's why there's been no new Marvel rides uh, since they opened. Um, but um, eventually, I, mean, I think I feel like they're going to eventually cycle it out because Disney is going to take that back at some point. Yes. Because they want they're, they're going to want to build a Marvel area for themselves, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, as far as Disney, like, uh, I know, yeah, the Marvel, Marvel, Impact hasn't really been strong okay. at, at, Dis at Disney World. Yeah, that's so fantastic with the both coast to coast, the east to west coast. Yeah, well, because there's, yeah, the like the there's no there's no Islands of Adventure uh, Universal yes. over on the west coast, so they don't have any com competition as far as making it confusing. On, on top of that, because Disney's been making most of their money now off of the comic industry, is what I'm oh, seeing. Of course, yeah. and it's 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 going to keep on growing. I love that people said, "Oh man, Disney buying Marvel? That's a bad idea." I said, "No, no, that's a great idea. Disney's going to help globalize comics to a whole new way we've never seen before." On top of Star Wars. Yes, and Star Wars being added in afterwards. Yeah. It's this pop culture phenomenon is just getting started. Yeah, yeah. And like with businesses like yours, I think that's great mm -hmm. because you're going to keep on seeing growth of different products always being offered to you. Yeah. So as styling online, what products are the best selling ones at this show for you? You know, it, it actually cycles. Like, um, I, there's I've seen it change. So like uh, some shows, and like the, the the buying culture changes from city to city. Okay. Whereas uh, last week in Orlando, we were selling a lot of belts. Okay. Don't know why. But so, but like but we, we we had belts and a lot of people were like perfect. I needed I need a new belt. Yes. But I got here and I I've, I've only sold like three belts. Personally, um I mean short wearers out here. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. <laughs> Orlando, you think the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. There's notion over there. Yeah, and by our mystery booth we have a whole on the back wall of it we have uh, socks. Yes. Um which sold sold very well in Detroit. Okay. I don't know how it's doing here but Detroit is a colder city. Yeah. So you got people layering up and so wearing socks. Whereas like on the West Coast, maybe in San Diego, you have a lot of sandal wears. And a lot of other people wearing socks. So it, it just depends on where you are. And like I said, and, and uh, hoodies. The only reason we sold any hoodies in Orlando was because it was cold inside the convention center. As soon as soon as you get outside, they were like, up, oh, taking it off. off. Sweaty. Yeah, but like the, while they were inside, they were like, oh, it's freezing in here. I need a hoodie. I'm gonna pay forty-five dollars to be comfortable inside here. But once I once I get out, I take it off. Well, when people are styling on. Line, what do you feel is the most fascinating thing they don't know about that you guys carry? That we carry? Um, I would say... I think the costume hoodies. Costume hoodies? Yeah, because it, it's an easy it's an easy way to cosplay without cosplaying. Nice, easy cosplay. Yeah, yeah it's, the convention. You feel like exactly. You just want to take a break and eat, take it off, and not a big deal. Exactly. So like you, you don't have to go through the struggle of having to make a whole cosplay. You just you buy a hoodie, you zip it up, and zip over. You have a mask and yes. everything. You you dress as a cool character that you now, that you now have, and it's it, like I said, it's simple and it's a hoodie you can wear at any at any time. And what's the price point someone should expect to spend on them? They on the co on the costume hoodies. Uh, they range from about 60. Six we, we, do ha we do have a nice uh, uh, Chewbacca hood. Nice. It's, it's reversible. Yes. So the the other side is uh, Han Solo's Hoth jacket. Yes. And it's got like, it says, it says Solo on it. It's got a little badge and everything. And that is that because you're getting two pieces of the more that's clothing for the price of one. That's yeah, an awesome. Those, and that one's uh, that one's 100. Uh, but that's, I mean, bucks, that's it's built. two hoodies in yes. one. We sold a lot of. 10 bucks on we, were in, we were in Star Wars Celebration. We sold a lot of those. Nice. And we had, you had people walking around. It's, it's bulky because you have Chewbacca 
they have like the fur coming off of it. Yeah, yes. people walking around with like huge Chewbacca. And that was it was it was more Chewbacca than Han. I think <laughs> they were they wanted to show off the, the Chewbacca, which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, the Star Wars celebration was very popular. Very cool. It's like anything else you want to share with us, Ricky? Um, I mean, honestly. I mean, our shirts are, are, like I said, officially licensed, um, and th- I think that that puts t- stands us out from the rest. I mean, yeah, the, the one thing about bootlegs is they can put any design on there that nice. you want. You can do a lot, a lot of crossovers, so you have, like, Pikachu wearing Deadpool stuff, or something like that. Um, but our officially licensed merch, I think, separates us and puts us above, not above, but... Uh, I think ahead of the game, like, and uh, having officially licensed items uh, kind of makes it worth it. You, you know, you know, you're getting stuff from the brand, so like Game of Thrones shirts. We, uh, HBO has, has licensed those shirts and uh, and marketing them, and I think they're they're well worth it. And we get a lot of the cooler co- cooler shirts that you can't get uh, other uh, other vendors wouldn't be able to get. And how many different T-shirt styles do you carry? Thousands. Uh, we, have, I love it. we have thousands. And not, not, not only that. in front of a, about a 10-foot tower of team. No more like 15-feet tower? Uh, How no, big is this? The, the grid is 8-foot to it's, uh, 8, uh, 10, 12, 14. It's about 14, 16 feet high. And then the banners are another... Let's say About Shaq 14 Scott. foot high. So, yeah, it's, yeah, no. Since we're talking Orlando before and Shaq started in Orlando, Shaq couldn't even touch the dunk on this. <laughs> no, not even close. We're, we're damn near touching the rafters yes. at well, this point. Ricky, what was your last name again, too? Felix. Felix. Ricky Felix here with us at Styling Online t shirt booth. And this is Ken Brown, who wants to thank you for joining us. Hey, and no uh, problem, look for, for us on nightcapchat.com. Yes. Oh, yeah. And if you get a chance, give it a listen and share it with people. We love listening to you. Perfect. Thank you very Appreciate much. It, man. And thanks again to Styling Online for taking the time to talk to us over their busy convention weekend. We're going to have a link in the description of this podcast to their website. They have an incredible selection of officially licensed tees, you know, from whether it's superheroes, Game of Thrones, you know, whatever your pop culture needs may be, they probably have it. So definitely recommend checking them out. Uh, I cannot express how awesome their shirts are. Um, for those of you who were at Phoenix Fan Fusion over the weekend, you might have seen that we had some flyers that said we were going to start some giveaways on today's episode. Uh, and this is, of course, open to anyone in the in the United States, 18 years or older. So just go to nightcapchat.com slash giveaways. So we'll have the link in the description of this podcast. Once again, that's nightcapchat.com slash giveaways. And we're giving away a little prize pack. So that's going to be a fun and exciting little thing. And now we're just going to cut to our uh, final closeout for Phoenix Fan Fusion. All right, we are literally now walking out of Phoenix Fan Fusion 2019. Yes. Fan Fusion just ended, and it's time to say goodbye, folks. But we, what a what a great convention! It was got. a great show, dude. I had a lot of different experiences that were unexpected, mm-hmm. and all the more memorable. Absolutely. Uh, what, was, what was your favorite thing? My favorite thing was actually getting time to walk the floor for a little bit. Yes. Because I said to you, Artist Alley was amazing yep. this year, but my favorite thing of all were these photo frames where they put Those comics cool. in the center of the frame uh-huh. and the guy etched out the mat Very to nice. fit like an extended mm-hmm. view of the comic. Yeah, that was really neat. Unbelievable. We'll post pictures yeah. on uh, Nightcap Chat's Facebook yeah. well, and I'll all, try to share those the, with all you. All the social media. Yeah, those are those are really neat. We got some really cool people. Uh, Ray Park was awesome. Uh, yes. Lucy Paul, the uh, voice of Mercy. Hope you guys also enjoyed those, uh, those interviews we did. Dude, of course at the end, you got to find the one dollar back issue bins because oh, yes. nobody wants to take their stuff home with them. Yep. We so were we again, were just caught up in the, in the dollar bin issue. I know we've talked about that before. It was like diving into a pool that's ten feet deep. You just like <laughs> dive in, and then it's hard to come back up. Yeah, I just I just scored a uh, a Dazzler versus Juggernaut, you know, X Men issue. What was it you say? Two. Uh, I forgot. I forgot the number. But how can you? You can't go wrong with uh, with Dazzler. Oh, two seventeen. Yes, yes, Uncanny X Men number two seventeen, which is awesome. That was a Walter Simonson cover with them mm-hmm. all running away from. The, from the Juggernaut, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorites. That's a two. That was my golden era of reading mm-hmm. X-Men. Yeah, that was, that was the best stuff. But thank you all for listening to this uh, special episode of Nightcap Chat with our Phoenix Fan Fusion coverage. And uh, I guess we'll see you all next week. You guys are the best. Thank you for listening. 